you know, the, the planet is, according to our climatologists, getting closer and closer to the to tipping point, or maybe we've gone beyond the tipping point of, of security for many species, including now, they're saying, our own. I've seen some headlines about the violence in the Middle East, maybe you have too. I've seen headlines about murders, about shootings particularly. There was, right, a couple of weeks ago in Paris, 12 innocent people were gunned down. The world went crazy over that. I, I actually thought of the irony of it. Um, because meanwhile, while 12 people had died, not to minimize their deaths, but there were thousands dying in Nigeria, for example. Or in the United States, every single 24 hours, there are 30 gun-related murders, approximately, taking place right here on our soil. And where are the protests? Where are the outrage? Hmm. I was looking at our newsletter last month and, and this month, and, and there's some disturbing stuff in there, especially if you look at the budget box, right? You see the budget box? We're, we're below in our offerings, and, and it looks scary because there's red there where it used to be black. And, and the reality is, you know, we've lost some saints over the past year, and and some have also decided they didn't want to be at our church anymore. They, they, I'll be honest about it, they didn't really like the new pastor and some of the new changes that were taking place, and I can understand that. That's very common. And so we have these things that are a little bit worrisome. We wonder about the future. We wonder what does the future hold for, for our world, for our church, for, for ourselves. And, and when Joyce read that psalm, that psalm which was really just a praise psalm, <laughs> if, it, if King David were here today, he'd probably have that praise song on the radio. We'd be singing while we drive to work or drive to home. But he is affirming. These are thousands of year old affirmations about the future. Praising our maker because He's got it taken care of, ultimately. Even though there's so much crazy stuff going on, there's that need to know he is being held and guided by God's right hand. The future is scary. The future can be mysterious. It's uncontrollable. It can be, it can be this enigmatic thing. We wonder, we look here in January, we look out over the next 11 months, what does the future hold? So much bad news. So many frightening headlines. And most of our lives, the reality is, most of our lives are spent preparing for and fearing the future. For good or for bad. We search for predictability. We search for explanations to bring peace to ourselves, to bring a sense of control. Often religion can bring that, right? Whatever our religion might be, religion can offer an escape for us. Sometimes it can help us feel safe and, and certain about things. It can give us security. We have to be careful. Right? If we, if we start worshiping our religion, we forget about the God our religion points to, and then there's no transformation. We're stuck. Religion can do that. You've heard me mention before <clears throat> my favorite Franciscan, Father Richard Rohr. He's a monk. He, he wrote some words in a book called The Naked Now. In fact, during the Christmas season, I had some of these words written up on our slide. He wrote in that book, the most amazing fact about Jesus, unlike any other religious founder, is that he found God in disorder and imperfection and told us that we must do the same or we would never be content on this earth. Finding God in disorder and imperfection. 
If we don't do that, we will never be content on this earth. Now, we like being content. We're all seeking contentment. But we don't like disorder and imperfection, do we? <laughs> what we often do is we respond by trying to protect ourselves. We want to take control of whatever we can control. Because when there's headlines, really, like, sayonara humankind, that makes us feel pretty out of control. So what can we control? Can we control some people? Can we control some things, some, some events, some, some places? Can we control the ideas of the people around us? Can we distract ourselves? In fact, distraction is a good way to help us feel not so out of control. We can keep busy. We can make ourselves so busy that we don't have to fear, and we don't have to feel out of control. We can become really important. We can begin buying more things, hoping that will help us feel the contentment, the safety, the security, and the peace. We, most of you have gadgets, I do. <laughs> I've got my gadget. <laughs> most of us did a lot of upgrading of our gadgets last year. And probably we will do some more upgrading this year. I will be upgrading, hopefully not. <laughs> I don't think I can afford it. But, you know, we're going to upgrade things that were made by virtual slaves in third world nations. Things made out of plastic and, and metal. And I wonder sometimes if there's a different sort of upgrade we could, we could focus on, right? I mean, what about upgrading the thing that is fearfully and wonderfully made by the creator of the universe himself? What about an upgrade for ourselves? What about that? You know, scripture tells us that anyone in Christ is a new creation. So we are meant to keep upgrading, not just our TVs and computers and phones. We are meant to keep upgrading ourselves with God's help. You know, there's that, there's that saying, that altar call, come down for the altar call. Maybe we need an altar call, I heard Shane Claiborne say. Maybe we need an altar call. Maybe we need to commit to changing a little bit of ourselves. In 2015, I'm hoping that you all will join me in committing to a self-upgrade, to trying something utterly new and utterly different this year. Maybe it's just responding differently to something that, that you've responded in not the most beneficial way in the past. Maybe it's buying something that you wouldn't have bought. Maybe it's saying something that you wouldn't have said or trying something that you would never have tried. Maybe something totally unrealistic. Maybe something that people would think that's impossible. People told me it was impossible to go to seminary when I was in my 40s. I don't know there's folks in here who went to seminary older than their 40s, and they did it. I saw this movie several years ago, maybe you've seen it, it's called The Gridiron Gang. Have you ever heard of that movie? It's a wonderful movie. We're going to show it one day on these screens. Um, it, it takes place in Los Angeles in this detention center. There's a lot of teenage boys and they're, they're um, gang members, they're just delinquent kids, really, really rough. And one of the staff members is really disturbed because there's this high recidivism rate, right? They, they serve their time, they, they leave, and then they're back really quickly. Or they leave and they're gunned down, or they're, they're just a victim of violence again. And so this staff member says, he gets it in his head, you know, we need to give these boys some kind of, some kind of hope, some kind of ability to see themselves as part of something bigger than them. Right? To give them a chance. So maybe we should have a football team. Right? 
So he goes to the administration of this, of this, uh, this detention center, and he floats his idea. Let's get all these boys that are basically fighting each other constantly, and let's put them on a football team. <laughs> And let's get them together, let's do that. And what do you think the, the powers that be said? No. No, 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 no. Totally unrealistic, totally impossible, can't do that. We've never done that before, because it could never work. And he pushed and he pushed and he tried and he tried and he tried. And they just simply said, it is impossible, end of discussion. And the, and the moment that, that, I have this little book, that I carry around with me, and sometimes I just hear something that just I just go, yes, I need that, and this is going to end up in a sermon one day. So this is this is that sentence. I read it, and here it is in the sermon now. But but this guy says he says, you know what? You have already tried what's possible. It's time to try what's impossible. That's what he said, and they did it. They did it, and it wasn't easy. They got all these boys together, and they, I mean, they did fight with each other. They hurt each other. There were ups and downs, but they were successful, and it made a difference in these boys' lives. Over 75 boys have now gone through this, this football program, this detention center in L.A., and, the, and, and it's just been an astronomical success, really has. They tried the impossible. I'm hoping in this church, you and I will commit this year to trying something that maybe you thought all along is totally impossible. Maybe it's just a different opinion. I don't know what it is. It's going to be different for each of us. What is it? Earl got up here and sang karaoke the other day. Last <laughs> night. Right? Friday night. Yeah. Now yeah, Melissa did too. She's never done that in her life. Impossible, could never do it. No way. <laughs> what is it you could try this year that, that you might think, oh, no way, that's impossible. And then maybe when you try it, would you be willing to share your story? Sign up for a testimony Sunday. You know, I've heard of this guy, you can look him up. Uh, his name is Nick Vujicic. He's from Australia. <laughs> He's an evangelist. He has no arms and no legs. He wanted to surf. Impossible, right? No, not impossible. He did it. Nick Vujicic can surf. He wanted to hang glide. He hang glides. He has no arms and no legs. Brothers and sisters, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, knit together, held together, made in the image of this incredible creator. We are a temple of his spirit. Why on earth would we want to upgrade a thing made of plastic and metal and not ourselves? Maybe upgrade from being in the same old rut. Maybe we've been in a rut for a long time. Maybe it's time to try something new in the middle of that rut. Why not? Or maybe we think we're done. Maybe we're tremendously blessed. Maybe we think we're not in any kind of rut at all. Maybe we live in a gated community and have lots of money in the bank and good health and a perfectly functioning vehicle. Lots of friends. Great! But the scripture says the path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter. It doesn't say the path of the righteous just ends to stay like that. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. We are blessed to be a blessing. We can get better. We can get better and better and better. Whatever it is that, that you choose, and I hope you'll choose something, shoot me an email about what it is. This is an impossible thing I'm going to try. This is a real unrealistic thing I'm going to try, Gail. Tell me. <laughs> shoot me an email. Tell me what you're willing to try this year. You know who Will Smith is, comedian, musician? He was saying, he was saying uh, in this interview, he goes, you know, it's really unrealistic to think that a piece of metal that weighs 800,000 pounds could, could fly in the air without falling. Isn't that incredible? Scientists say it's unrealistic 
that we're even born. Boy, do you know the chances of you being born were one in four trillion? The oh chances of you being born. <laughs> it's highly unrealistic that boy would be sitting right there. It was the same for all of us. This year, I want you to join me. I hope you will join me in being willing to embrace what's unrealistic. And if anybody tells you, don't try that, why are you doing that? What will they say? Or how could you? Tell them you serve a highly unrealistic God. Tell them you serve a God who would raise a dead guy from the grave and who raised raises you from the grave. Some of us are walking around with, we're already in the grave and in, in, in here. <coughs> and that time hasn't come yet. You're a new creation. Tell them Christ rising was unrealistic. Your God expects nothing less from you. So it's not sayonara to the impossible. It's not sayonara to humankind. I say, konnichiwa. <laughs> konnichiwa to all of this. Because Christ was raised. And he lives in you. And we can face the uncertainties, face the mystery of the future with that one certainty, that one life-giving certainty. He lives. And that is realistic. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I hope you'll join me now in standing as you are able, and we will sing a song of response. He lives!